Ready. All right, everybody, let's get started. Uh, this is Dave Vellante. We're here live from Wikibon headquarters, and I'm here with my co good friend and colleague, John MacArthur of Walden Technology Partners, who's a great Wikibon contributor. Hello, John. Hi, David. Thanks for coming in today. So um, we are here. We're broadcasting live. If you want to watch live, we're on uh, justin.tv slash Wikibon. That's justin.tv slash Wikibon. And um, I would suggest that if you're going to watch live that you turn down the, uh, your, your phone and, uh, and or your, your PC, but don't have them both running because there's a slight delay in the audio stream. Um, and so today's Peer Insight, the topic is cloud archiving forever without losing a bit. And we've got uh, several great guests on today. Thank you very much for joining us, folks. Um, let me first introduce Justin Stottlemyer, who's the um, Director of Storage Architecture at Shutterfly. <laughs> so if you I just have to ask if you if you're not speaking, if you could put your line on mute, star six will do that. So if you I just have to ask if, you, if you're not speaking, if you could put your line on mute, star six will do that. Or I can do it for you. Um, <laughs> just bear with me for a second, folks, and I will. Uh, Okay, so uh, Justin is the Director of Storage Architecture at Shutterfly. Uh, we also have joining us Sebastian Zangaro, who is the co-chair of the SNEA SIG uh, on uh, cloud archiving and the R and R and D architect at HP, and also a co-chair of that same SNEA SIG is Chad Thibodeau, who is with CleverSafe. He's the Director of Product Management uh, at, at, at CleverSafe and also handles alliances over there. So. Uh, can you guys all hear me? Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, David thank you, Floyer, th th thank you. Uh, David Floyer is also on the call. I think, uh, David, you were with good us morning. earlier, so good morning. So let me set up the call uh, very briefly, and then we'll jump right in. So organizations are uh, increasingly finding that traditional array-based storage is um, not meeting the cost and data integrity requirements for cloud archiving. There are less expensive approaches emerging and computer scientists are suggesting a fundamental change to uh, the way in which we protect data, uh, disperse data, and erasure coding uh, is increasingly gaining a foothold in the marketplace uh, rather than brute force replication. And this peer, peer insight is going to look at those trends and look at the use case of partic in particular of cloud archiving and we've got a number of experts joining us today. So I'd like to start uh, by setting up the call uh, with an overview of what the SNEA SIG is, is doing. So Sebastian and Chad, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what are the key requirements that the SIG is looking at um, and what are you guys trying to accomplish? Uh, let's start there and then we'll talk a little bit more about the taxonomy. So Sebastian, maybe you could lead us off, please. Sure, thank you. So. Um, let me give you a brief overview of what we do in SNEA. So basically for all of you that maybe don't know SNEA, SNEA is the Storage Network Industry Association. It's basically um, sort of a group of people from companies, uh, yeah, storage companies, that they, um, the mission of SNEA is to basically promote standards, technologies, and educational services for um, to empower everything related to storage and management of information. Um, so, we have different groups inside the SNEA. One of those groups is the Cloud Storage Initiative. It's an initiative that um, is um, working on the cloud uh, storage area. Um, several, so, for example, the um, uh, one of the standards that SNEA is um, uh, promoting, which is CDMI, Sebastian. Yeah, Sebastian. This is Chad. I, your connection. I don't know if you guys. Your connection's a little bit tough, and, and you're breaking up a little bit. And I don't know if others are hearing that. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, that's yeah. true. Chad, do you want, do you want to uh, explain? Yeah, a let bit? me. Sure. So, Sebastian, so let me let me go through some what you and I have talked about, Sebastian. So. Um, Sebastian was okay. starting to outline 
the cloud archive and preservation mission is to advance the use of public and private and as well as hybrid clouds for archive services and then long-term data retention. And the key is that we are underneath the Cloud Storage Initiative or CSIGNA, which is responsible for developing the CDMI specification, which is a data management interface standard. Um, it's really the only industry standard right now that's been proposed to tackle the challenges of, of data from one public cloud storage provider to another. So today there exists um, proprietary standards but not an industry standard and that is really the goal of the CSI group as well as the goal of the CDMI spec. So with our group we're obviously much more focused on archive and long-term um, preservation and then also the challenges that go along with it. So some of the things that we're trying to tap in our group are things like migration challenges from one public provider to another, um, data format challenges um, relating to long-term data preservation, right, as, as files and formats um, evolve over time, ensuring that uh, customers or businesses have the ability to access um, that data with those different formats. Um, the other, some other things we're also looking at doing is, you know, trying to understand other requirements that the long-term preservation industry has, um, you know, people who refer to them as curators. And again, it's, it's much more than just accessing objects. It also then gets into the realm of doing e-discovery and management and um, uh, basically just trying to do a better job of organizing all of that data, again, from more long-term perspective than short-term. And I think that's, again, really what Justin is going to jump in and, and talk about as he goes through uh, some of the challenges that he is using at Shutterfly. So, so, uh, if just so that's kind of the premise for the Cloud Archive and Preservation. A couple other things just to set up some context, that, as David alluded to in the beginning, is we are proposing a couple of terms as well. And again, this is from the point of SNEA. So there exists you know, similar definitions in other organizations, but we're trying to put context on from the SNEA perspective. So, for example, um, this taxonomy, the Cloud Digital Archive Service, which is basically a cloud-based service specializing in online storage repository for the purpose of compliance, litigation support, or retention for ex extended periods of time. So, with that idea, um, again, we're also then alluding back to um, leveraging the other organizations within C SNEA and specifically, for example, this CDMI specification to achieve, you know, that uh, archive service. Um, so that's an example of a taxonomy term that we're submitting. Again, there's other challenges. Uh, without into a lot of depth on them, we will really more time uh, hearing from Shutterfly and from Justin on, on what he's doing. But let me just put a, um, a couple of plugs out there for our group. So we're going to be at Cloudburst. So for those that are uh, listening in, Cloudburst is a comp that happens at the end of September. It actually follows um, storage developments. So if you just do a Google search for Cloudburst, uh, you'll see information on that. And we'll also be um, presenting at SNW. Um, which is in fall, and that's around October time frame. Um, and again, if, if you go to the CNET site or you do Google searches for Cloudburst or SNW fall 2011, uh, you'll get a lot more information. Um, we will be presenting at those, and that's where um, people can learn a lot more about the Cloud Archive and Preservation Group. And then last, uh, if you go to www.nia.org slash cloud, archive, there is a web page dedicated to our group. And again, that's a public um, place. You don't have to be a member of SNEA actually to access that. And there's information there. So, okay. so that's, that's kind of a quick summary of our group. Uh, I guess David and David, if uh, you want to open it up for any questions for our group before we kind of go into the Shutterfly. Yeah, Chad, I had a, I had, I had a question, uh, just a, just a clarif clarifying question. So it sounds like the 
the SNEA SIG is really focused on a lot of the same requirements that we know and love around archiving. Right, John? Immutability, right. Uh, provenance, um, about, you know, things like changing the technology over time. In other words, will the hardware that I use today be able to support this down the road? Are, are those issues part of the discussion as well, Chad? Correct, yes, exactly. So um, you bring up a good point, David. Yeah, there, there's really a lot of different areas that we can go into trying to do for right now. So we're, we're a brand new group as of January. What we're really trying to do is just on a couple to start with that we can make an impactful difference and we can try to help educate the industry on absolutely right. You know, we, our expectation is it's going to branch into many different areas. But yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. Okay, so let me, let me stop there and open it up. Does anybody have any questions specifically as it relates to what SNE is trying to do, the standards? I mean, a lot of people are skeptical. I mean, I'll throw another one out there just to get the discussion going. A lot of people have, are skeptical of, of standards bodies and, and, and SNEA has often been, been criticized despite the good work that they're doing. My understanding is that the CDMI standard is, is advancing at a much more rapid pace than what we're used to. Um, is that, can you confirm that and, and why is that? Yes, actually, that, that's a perfect segue. So I, I forgot to mention that right now, SNEA is in the process of submitting the second revision. It's really, it's version 1.0.1 of the um, specification, but they're submitting that to ISO. And they're also working with us. So, so I agree that in the past, there's been challenges that SNEA has come up against, you know, in trying to define certain standards. Uh, I think success they've had with the CDMI spec is first and foremost because they've learned a lot from their past experience and so, you know, they're, they're definitely trying to not duplicate those mistakes or replicate those mistakes and so they're making sure to engage with these different um, other standards bodies like IO, NIST, you know, IEEE, so, um, I, you know, I do believe that C will be successful, and again, right now, there is nothing else that's really being proposed um, that is going up against it. So I think it does have some good momentum. Yeah, and this is John. Uh, you mentioned a number of areas, uh, data migration, data preservation, um, uh, file formats. When you think about the specification, um, it would be good to have some discussion around uh, what areas are, are some of the more difficult areas to actually reach consensus on a specification? Yeah, so I guess to, to make it a brief answer, because that can go really many different ways and we can't hold, but you know, I think the, one of the challenges with the current spec is, the specification is that it's really meant to address public providers um, and consequently, there's many different ways that people can, can support public clouds in terms of um, with different metadata options, interface options. So the, the CDMI spec is trying to be broad in that respect. Um, however, I think one challenge that, you know, may end up happening is when people actually implement it, you know, that they maybe take exception to a too much of that specification and still can remain complete. I think that's one of the challenges when you're trying to make a broad spec is, you know, by doing that, give people maybe too much flexibility so that they have to keep an eye on that. But outside of that, again, it's actually going very, very well. I've participated in some of the technical work groups and again, you've got some big industry companies that are participating as part of development, the spec development and, and um, Again, it's going surprisingly well. So. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, Shutterfly and the case study there. Uh, Justin, if we could, if we could turn to you. Shutterfly is just an awesome service. It's a personal publishing service. You go to the Shutterfly website, and 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 right there, they tell you uh, we 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 store your pictures for free. It's unlimited storage. Uh, we we secure them um, at a at a full resolution. So right away. John, we're seeing some <laughs> really challenging storage problems. So Justin, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, start with you know, some background on Shutterfly, what your role is there, and then let's dig into the particular problem that you had to solve here. Absolutely. So my 
role at Shutterfly, obviously, is director of storage architecture. Background here is I started about a year and a half ago with the challenge of taking the existing data store, which was at 19 petabytes of raw disk at the time, and coming up with a new and cheaper solution to be able to maintain the archive long term. Um, taking a look when I first started, Shutterfly was doing anywhere between 7 and 30 terabytes of new data per day that obviously has to be maintained long term. Um, I've taken a look at a lot of different components of data, obviously, as cell phones and other cameras components become much more ubiquitous to every single person in the world. You know, our user base continues to grow, and as do as do are the amount of photos rolling in day in day out. Sorry, was there a question? No. Uh, no. Please continue. Okay. So, uh, obviously, with the um, the promise of free unlimited photo storage archive forever, it uh, means that you're going to be buying an awful lot of storage and maintaining that for a lot of users. That also means that costs continue to go up, and mean time between mean time to between failure. Uh, components are going to continue to increase in failure rates as you end up with more and more pieces. So with 19 petabytes online, I've been here about four or five months before I uh, and investigating a slew of technologies and I kind of determined what it was I wanted to go for moving forward. And we actually ended up, which was uh, in short, an erasure code, an erasure coded object store um, with RAIN embedded, right? So effectively, being able to do an N plus M style erasure coding mechanism as opposed to something like RAID 5, which is N plus 1, or RAID 6, which is N plus 2. With N plus M, obviously, I could go 10 plus 6 or 8 plus 5 or whatever the case may be, not to get into specifics. but um, And then, obviously, using RAIN, it will allow us to do something uh, of a commoditized style nature on the back side where we can throw relatively generic style hardware at this as a storage platform. So, so Justin, uh, Justin, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to let people know, some of you may not be familiar with uh, terminology or maybe want some other background. On Wikibon, uh, wikibon.org, right in the center of the page under professional alerts, there are two new articles that went up uh, just recently. Uh, the second from the top, right under professional alerts, is perpetual archiving for the cloud. It's got some diagrams in there, and we may be discussing those in more depth. And then there's another one on erasure coding and cloud storage eternity. Uh, which David Floyer wrote, it just describes erasure codes and, and how they apply. So go ahead and check those out. Um, sorry to interrupt, Justin. That's right, I'll, I'll want to check those out too. <laughs> so, so it ended up that we actually had a bit of an incident last year um, where one of our traditional storage arrays had a controller issue, and this is a two petabyte storage array, and it ended up losing 172 drives in one shot, which um, cost us uh, parity across the entire system. Now we had no data loss and um, we actually obviously we prepare for the for in the event of something that happens but still um, a two petabyte array going offline or close to it is not a uh, pleasant experience that anyone wants to go through. So I ended up taking us three days to calculate parity back to one parity bit and almost three weeks totally to get a dual parity back across the entire system. That just helped to validate my uh, my position that you know using a almost nothing shared model of, and using erasure coding on RAIN to move forward were really going to be what it took to get to uh, the level of redundancy and security that we need for our archive. And it ends up that today we're at roughly 30 petabytes of raw disk right now. We're seeing about 40% year over year growth. Uh, on average, we're seeing 25% year-over-year increase in in image size, and uh, there doesn't appear to be any slowing down of the amount of data coming in the front door. So, Justin, I wonder if I could um, just, again, level set for the audience that may not be as familiar with these issues, and we've talked about this before on Wikibon Peer Insights. The, as disk capacities grow, uh, the time it takes to do rebuilds on a, on a failure, it becomes onerous. Um, right, exactly. So, I mean, I'll give an example here. Today, in a traditional RAID, RAID 6 style array, if you lose a two terabyte drive, it's going to take you, you know, anywhere between, let's say, 
50 hours on an almost completely idle array that can do nothing but just copy data in and out to recover that drive to maybe as many as two weeks if you're running on a really busy array that has to share I.O. on the backside to recover that drive and has very limited resources to do so. So you've got so, you know, you've got the issue of limited resources, and the and the, the the biggest issue is that you're exposed during that rebuild time, and the probability of a of data loss uh, uh, dramatically increases. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So with for each parity bit you increase on the back side, effectively you end up with roughly 100x uh, the reliability. And obviously the math changes slightly differently as you add parity bits, but it's a it's a pretty uh, good guide or rule of thumb. And so you end up with, um, uh, there's actually a couple of components there. So let's say on traditional storage array, for example, if you've got a 8 plus 2 RAID 6 stripe on the back side, you end up, uh, no matter how full the uh, parity group is, say you've got it 10% full, if you lose a drive, you actually have to reconstruct the entire drive to rebuild the parity group. On some of the newer components, let's say you're doing an erasure-coded object store, for example, you actually you only actually have to re recover the missing data. Now you might have to read that from more components. Like, let's say if you're doing a 12 plus 3, you might be re reading off of much, many more components. But that means you also have a lot more resources to be able to do so, and you have a 100x. You know, at worst case, you're down to a RAID 6 style reliability model. And so, there, and so, assuming you had a drive failure. Uh, if, if you use that same sort of analogy of, or, or comparison on a, on a RAID 6 rebuild, um, what's your time going to, what's the sort of range of times it's going to be to rebuild uh, using erasure code? Now it depends on the, obviously it depends on the uh, throughput of the system and a couple of other things, but you know, I've had drives recover in a matter of one to two hours in my current example just because, you know, only had a small amount of data on it and had a lot of resources left to be able to go through and uh, rebuild, the, rebuild the drive because it was just a traditional file system copying effectively data on it rather than having to reconstruct the entire array. Now, worst case, of course, I'm going to have to say I'm 100% full on that erasure-coded segment or on that drive, then would have to do a full rebuild and it could potentially take a little bit longer as I don't have enough necessarily the resources of a, of a million dollar array on the backside of my you know, commodity hardware platform. So that said, I've still got three or four or five other parity bits that can carry me through until that's done. So I'd say worst case, I'm actually slightly slower to recover, but with a greater, with a much greater amount of redundancy. Um, and best case, which has been the case so far, I recover in a matter of hours. So are you in the process of migrating over from RAID 6 to Erasure Code, or what's the status of your of your environment now? Well, I don't want to give you know, away all the secret sauce, okay. but effectively we are doing a combination of oh, a, a lot of different things. So, you know, on the same side, as, you know, we've got a lot of traditional arrays, obviously, and I don't think that those are going to go away anytime soon. And uh, I actually think that, you know, traditional array storage vendors are going to at some point catch on and probably implement erasure coding in their controllers to the backside as opposed to traditional RAID mechanisms. But that'll be a big change from how uh, users are used to addressing storage. Um, in so the meantime, we're actually, uh, you know, we've got a traditional massive archive problem. Right, I mentioned that when I started a year and a half ago, we were at 19 petabytes. Today, we're over 30. Um, so, and it, so it, yeah. we're actually constantly migrating data uh, all over the place, as well as um, with a com you know a massive influx of data on a day-to-day -day basis. So, at any given time, we're not only migrating data on the backside to keep our uh, disk IOPS kind of balanced across the entire site, we're also getting a big influx of data. So, we're doing both. Is the, is the short answer. Okay. Um, so drive failures in your environment at that many petabytes is a, is a daily occurrence multiple times a day probably. Is that, is that uh, correct? You know, there might be the odd day where we don't see a drive failure, but uh, typically we see at least one to two per day. Yeah. So your primary driver was uh, peace of mind during that, that rebuild process. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mentioned before that I had five days with no parity. Right, and any you know, when you have a big array like that, you obviously not only have to you have to effectively stripe the, stripe the arrays one way, and then you have to stripe the volumes built across it the other way. 
so effectively any single additional drive failure at that time would have cost me effectively the entire array mix. So I would have had 1.8 petabytes of data down that I would have had to pull back up off of tape potentially. Can or out of, I have a temporary second copy that I might have had it there. But either way, it would have been uh, an ugly situation. So yeah, absolutely. You know, now, anytime I, you know, today, anytime we had a drive failure, you know, you're kind of keeping an eye out for the second one. And if the second one goes, you're in a real uh, bad place until you actually get the first parity bit recovered. Uh, now, you know, if I have a drive fail, there's no rush to get it replaced. I've still got, you know, multiple other parity bits that can cover the workload in the event of a problem. Okay. Um, as, as well as, um, you know, silent corruption problems uh, that exist within SATA at scale or, or any system at scale effectively, you know. It's not just uh, hard failures, it's soft failures that you need to account for. And so, you know, with every, you know, I think uh, drive uh, unrecoverable read errors right now are at 1 to the 16th to the 14th, depending on the drive type, which means roughly every, well, let's call it every 12 to 100 terabytes, you're going to get an unrecoverable read error off of the drive, right? Soft failure, unrecoverable read error, not hard failure, the drive is down, you're recovering. Now, that'll still pull from RAID or erasure coding to be able to recover that, but that means that the effective chance of having a dual failure or a triple failure increase exponentially as you get to multiple petabytes like I have. So, you know, I could potentially run into the problem where I don't have a drive fail. This is the scary part, right? Where I don't have a drive failing and I have two unrecoverable read errors or three unrecoverable read errors within a segment. Now it's granted it's highly unlikely, but it's altogether possible. Yeah, so this is the, cl the cloud uh, perspective because we're talking about petabytes, not, not terabytes here. Um, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the economics. I mean, from a business case standpoint, clearly there's a risk factor that you can point to. What about other, other cost factors um, related to uh, comparing erasure uh, uh, coding approaches with traditional RAID? What did you find there? So there's a lot of ups and downs, right? As you know, I'm effectively building an internal cloud, which makes things much easier. When you're dealing with an external cloud, you, you start paying for someone else's disks and someone else to maintain them, as well as inbound and outbound network on their side, as well as your side. So external cloud really didn't look to make much sense for me, especially at my scale. Um, where uh, now, now that I haven't evaluated it, some looking at it, you know, as a small scale um, storage start, as a small scale startup. Um, the advantage to going with an, an external cloud are huge because you've got no investment time, no investment cost. So you just outsource it and, you know, rapid iteration on your development to get going. So for small for small companies, I could see it's, I would say it's actually highly beneficial and almost certainly the way to go from an ROI perspective. For larger companies, I think they'll be continuing to look at uh, internal clouds. Uh, now I've done a lot of I've, I was specifically brought in here to greatly reduce costs. I was hit with a huge cost challenge of uh, getting down to, I think, 33% uh, of what the existing storage w world was charging. Uh, and you can imagine when you buy it two petabytes or three petabytes at a time, you get a decent bulk discount Costco style. So uh, we had to take a relatively novel approach to doing so. and. Uh, again, I'll leave some of the details out, but effectively, you know, people start to talk with erasure coding, um, you know, while you're getting with plus three or plus four or plus five on these parity bits. So, you know, why not just do multiple copies if you're going to have that much parity anyway? You may as well have two or three copies of the data. Well, the truth of the matter is with the dynamic erasure coding model of, let's say, K plus N, you could be doing, if, you, if you're traditionally an eight plus two RAID model, you could be doing a 16 plus four erasure coding model and end up with the exact same amount of overhead, but with 10,000 X worth of reliability from a storage perspective, right? And on top of that, you're effectively going to be doing that on commodity style hardware rather than, uh, you know, a, a, a very expensive uh, traditional, fi uh, a very traditional uh, storage mechanism from a big iron that has a very expensive uh, hardware cost. So, so you made an interesting point um, 
in your comments that, that if you're a small company that has, hasn't invested a ton in an existing infrastructure, you might, wa might want to think about uh, starting your, your archive in the, in the cloud as opposed to creating your own internally. Um, you definitely have to have a model, though, I would say, for when, you know, if that's going to start costing you more on one side than the other and have a plan for getting in and getting out. So that, that good point. So, so that then very much brings in the question, which I, which I heard from the SNEA representatives, of uh, the importance of having a data migration mechanism. I assume it, at uh, 30, 40 plus terabyte, uh, petabytes, that you're not looking for how you're going to migrate that data uh, off-site uh, to, a, to, to, a, to a, a public cloud. But if I'm somebody who started in the public cloud and I'm thinking of either bringing it in-house or migrating between public cloud providers, then I'm then I need to think very much about those issues. Do you have any advice? Absolutely. Do you have any advice for people who are sort of at that decision point? Uh, yes. Keep multiple copies of your metadata. <laughs> um, one of the other things is actually we check some every single, you know, it's effectively we're image based here, so we actually check some every single image going in and going out, right? Because we're constantly doing migrations. So, you know, we actually have a copy verify, uh, or, you know, a read copy verify uh, as these jobs occur when we're migrating massive amounts of data. So, you know, it's not just enough that we, uh, that we read and move the data. We actually have to verify and validate that our data is still what we think it is. You know, any of these unrecoverable errors could occur at any given time effectively, and it could be a silent corruption problem. So anytime we do a write of data to anywhere, we actually read it, we effectively do a read verify and do a SHA-1 checksum guaranteeing our data consistency in and out. And when you're doing that with a public cloud, it's even more important to do so. So I'm imagining with all of the, so I'm imagining with all those checks that uh, the time window for migrating uh, large amounts of data is, is fairly extended. Absolutely. I mean, you're effectively not only copying it, you're then reading it back. So it definitely creates a, uh, a bit of overhead. Now that said, you know, you can, there's there are definitely ways you can optimize it. I mean, effectively, if you read it relatively quickly after you write it, uh, you can still catch it while it's, uh, in, while the file handle is in cache and a couple other little things. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're still going to be reading you know, terabytes, hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of data back. You, you know, we're talking... To validate your data. In talking about this idea of a small startup using the public cloud and avoiding CapEx up front, uh, and then maybe over time trying to take things in-house to reduce its cost, there's a great case study on Wikibon that Dave Cahill wrote about Zynga. If you just uh, search on Wikibon for Zynga, you'll see the case study. It's a really fascinating way of how they're bringing sort of a commodity cloud in-house, and, and it sounds... Uh, Justin, like you've done something similar, and of course your background at Facebook and, and eBay, where costs are pretty fundamental, gave you some street cred, I guess, to do this. You said you were tasked with reducing already relatively low storage costs by, you said 30%, is that correct? No, 233%. 230 ah, 230% of where you were. Uh, wow, okay, great. Big yeah, number. Very challenging. And right. actually, it's funny you say that with Zynga because actually, when I was coming to Shutterfly, I was I was I had uh, had some talks and played some golf with the VP of Operations over there about doing that for them as well. So <laughs> I'm intimately familiar with the Zynga model of how they did that, and you know, they had a, that, that's an exactly that's exactly what I was talking about. That's a great case, right? That they, they had massive expansion. Uh, they would have had huge issues uh, keeping up with demand internally up front. Uh, without, you know, they're a big dev shop. They didn't necessarily have the operations workhorse or experience in house already to be able to expand out their storage infrastructure or their CPU infrastructure. So they relied on Amazon with EC2 and S3 to be able to do so. But you know, after after six to nine months of that, all of a sudden, you know, they're still wildly profitable. But they can take a look, somebody can sit there and take a look at the number and see how much money's going out the door to Amazon and think, you know what, we could probably do this cheaper in house. Yeah, and, and it, that, that's exactly my point. And they've built a true hybrid cloud on commodity components with the a Amazon Web Services plus what they call the Z Cloud, which is a very fascinating case study. So, um, okay, I wonder if we could come back to sort of the erasure coding and and we, we I think we understand why erasure coding, but 
But what did you specifically do? I mean, it's not, I mean, racial coding is not mainstream, is it? And, and how'd you find it? I mean, what did you use? What was the, the solution that you deployed? Can you talk about that a little bit? And as, part of, and as part of that, can you also talk about the intellectual property components of erasure coding? Uh, is, are, there, are there patents around it? And who owns those patents? And, and, uh, yeah, so let's take those separately. What, yeah. what, uh, what did you do? What was, the, what was the solution that you deployed and, and Actually, why? Well, I'll start a little higher level on that, but I started with um, kind of a list of requirements of what I needed to have happen. Right. Uh, or what did I need to make occur, right? And eventually that's where I got down the path to, okay, I need erasure coding and I need rain. And from there, I just started trying to track down companies, software, open source projects, uh, anything you can think of to get uh, down that road. And so I uh, ended up, I've actually, I'm actually working with uh, Chad, who's on the call, and Cleversafe to, uh, for our deployment. And it's fairly successful to date. Um, we've got a lot of back and forth. I've got a lot of ideas around um, how we should actually deploy things like this at scale. Um, but you know, that said, I looked at uh, open source projects from UC Santa Cruz like Ceph, which is not ready for prime time. I looked at uh, Tahoe LAFS. There's uh, other companies out there like, uh, there's, they have a competitor, Ampla Data. Um, but you know, I kind of, we obviously I was just shooting for best of breed and to um, make sure I could get done what I needed to get done and meet my challenges met. And so at the time, uh, they seem to have a much greater uh, foothold in the market, even though they're still a relatively small startup. They kind of had a lot, of, you know, there was multiple years of development time behind this. So when you get down the path of, okay, there's these two or three open source projects, there's one, maybe two valid companies that can already do this. You know, you get to this build, the build or buy decision, um, whether or not you can be successful in any of these given, at any given time effectively. And so, you know, uh, working with CleverSafe, uh, I believe they use a Reed Solomon style erasure code, and so you know they've done a lot of optimization, a lot of changes to make that uh, dynamic. I believe uh, to be able to scale that up or down as they see fit. Which you know, I mean, effectively, RAID five and RAID six are also erasure codes. They're just fixed width. Uh, so you, we ended up uh, doing a lot of testing, a lot of deployment internally, and at the same time, uh, any, at any given time today, for example, uh, we take in a write from a customer, goes to a single array, gets checksummed and back and forth through the application and validated. That also gets written to a second array at the same time and validated. Um, to be able to ensure that, you know, I could implement this new technology at the same time that uses a different mechanism, it's no longer obviously uh, traditional block-based storage, it's a new style of object store. Um, we put in a lot of, or actually I put in a lot of, I wrote a lot of requirements for how the software has to maintain back and forth uh, availability between all of these components and how they're going to maintain metadata consistency between all of them as well, right? So you're talking back and forth to multiple databases, you're maintaining object IDs, which is another problem, right, with an object store. You now have to maintain your metadata is no longer part of the file system. Your metadata is now an object that gets an object ID that gets handed back to you over the wire when you do, you know, an HTTP put or however you push the data into your object store. <coughs> so um, maintaining metadata consistency becomes even more important because you can't just do an, you know, uh, you can't just check the data on the file system. There's no LS. There's no FSCK to recover the file system, right? It's either there or it's not for your metadata. And so, you know, we actually maintain not only our traditional metadata store, that was a traditional uh, Oracle star all file system, or sorry, Oracle style database that maintain, also maintains the file system data because, you know, anywhere you look, when you have an application that talks to a file system, the application isn't actually reading the file system. The application is getting metadata out of a database that then talks to a file system. So it's not that huge a leap to be able to explain to developers how to shove an OID in it instead of, or an object ID or you know, a globally, global unique ID into a database that just exists, exists alongside on a, uh, in a new table or a new column to be able to add that data. But we're maintaining that multiple different ways to guarantee consistency. You know, 
um, you know, not only do we have it in one database, we push up in another database. Potentially, um, you know, we're doing a lot of work with Mongo at Shutterfly, uh, so we're actually using a MongoDB database as well. Well, NoSQL DB, uh, as well as we shove it into a traditional file store, or sorry, we just shove all the uh, metadata components out into a traditional log file, which, you know, worst case means you can just read the log file back and rebuild your metadata if you have to. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing some other uh, some other consistency checks and components as well around metadata that um, I'll call secret sauce for now and leave it at that. Cool. Um, John, to your point about um, intellectual property, you know, Cleversafe is a you know, relatively new company, startup, small company in, in Illinois. Um, kind of stealthy, even, you know, they've, they've had some funding and that was sort of quiet up front. They do a lot of stuff with military and government applications, so a lot of the customers don't don't talk, right? It's the along, along those lines, they didn't find me. I found them. You right? found, yeah, so, interesting. <laughs> and I had to look long and hard to do so. Yeah. So I, I think I had lunch with a buddy that is a, another storage guy, and he's like, and I was telling him what I was working on and trying to build, and he's like, "Have you looked at these guys?" And I think that was how I found them. Yeah, I mean, we kind of you know, over lunch. It was not you know a Google search or anything like that. <laughs> And Nick Allen turned us on to CleverSafe a couple of years ago, and he, he's sort of a trend spotter in new technologies. And so I know I was talking to Chris Gladwin in the spring, John, yeah. when CleverSafe issued uh, a press release around some new patents that it had, it had secured, five new patents. But the interesting thing to me is Chris told me that they had 65 patents pending. And then he talked about the number of claims that they had associated with those patents. It was literally hundreds. So normally a small startup maybe has a couple of patents. Right. There's a very patent heavy you know, company with a bunch of MIT alpha geeks. Mm. I mean, even the head of marketing is a MIT alpha geek. So it's like you got to have that in your DNA, I guess. But um, OK, so I want to um, do a check here. I, we, we've been dominating the conversation with uh, a few people. And I know there are folks online that may want to ask some questions. I, uh, I had to mute some lines because we had some, some background noise. So I'm going to slowly unmute them. But before, while I'm doing that, I wonder if I could bring in David Floyer. David, you there? Yes, I am. Could you talk a little bit about your perspectives on this? Um, we've been hearing about a lot of the, the, the benefits, a few of the drawbacks. Give us, keep us honest. What's your, what's your view of this whole discussion? Uh, what are the, some of the gotchas that practitioners should be thinking about? piece up on, on sort of 101 uh, erasure coding uh, so people can have a look at it. And I think it was mentioned before that RAID 5, RAID 6 are examples of erasure uh, coding. Um, but the, the, the key is that the, as you increase the number of fragments, the number of uh, components break, uh, that you can break it down into, uh, so your availability uh, for the same amount of resources goes up uh, absolutely astronomically. Um, there's, a, there's a case study, if you've just got a single copy, uh, and that's at 99% availability, with the same equipment, you can r raise that to uh, nine nines, uh, 99.1234567, eight. I mean, it's just a, a huge increase. So Actually, from I, mean, a, I just want to add a little anecdote there, which is, Based on the math and looking at RAID 5 and RAID 6 reliability, I was theoretic, I should have theoretically been losing 136 megabytes of data per year for the size of my archive. Um, now my uh, data availability number, according to the math, if you believe it, should be that I can maintain data reliability for around 5 million years. Right. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's the math of it. It's amazing, isn't it, the, the increase. So uh, as a technique, uh, it's uh, clearly uh, um, going to be valuable as, as, as the uh, size of the disk get bigger. The, the downside is very clearly is in terms of how do you manage this. It requires a lot more resources, compute resources, to actually do this. Um, so you, and you need completely different types of management of the validity and the um, uh, identity of all these blocks. So that's the downside is that you you have a completely new method, new new methods with taking a lot more process of uh, time and effort. And obviously for archiving, that's one of the reasons why it's it's suitable to begin with as as as, it, uh, as the compute time 
uh, is high. And, uh, and because the compute time is high, especially if you're spreading that over, over different nodes, over different locations, the response time obviously uh, is, is higher that way as well. So the trade-off is response times are slightly higher, the, the amount of compute is higher, um, but the availability and cost is much lower. If, if you think about the uh, availability, um, cost, and performance as the three uh, edges of the triangle, and the three trade-offs, so um, uh, those are the trade-offs that you have here. So, David, you've but been David, you've been watching. So just to finish, sorry. Sorry. go ahead. I, uh, just to finish uh, off, uh, where it's going in the future, I think. Um, um, uh, Justin said it, uh, these techniques can be used within arrays just as much as uh, between nodes. And uh, I, I think there's going to be fairly rapid adoption of these types of techniques um, within storage arrays as well as within cloud arrays uh, where you've got multiple nodes over the cloud. By when? Can, can you give us a, a time frame? Um, I, uh, Things always take longer to move out than, than you ever think in terms of seeing new arrays with this sort of uh, capability. I think within you'll see the, the first coming out within a couple of years, and then it'll be uh, you know a three to five year um, uh, technology migration time. But uh, certainly within two years, you'll see the first of these coming out. Is this the cloud? Is this the dominant cloud use case in your opinion? This sort of ar archiving model. Oh, well, that's the one it's going to start with. I think I don't think it's uh, you know as the number of cores increase on the processors and we get the amount of compute power. I, I think this is going to become actually a, a dominant for all types of uh, of storage. So the math is just too too strong. Um, I agree with that completely. I, I want to give, we're, we've really dominated the conversation. I want to just stop and let every, let every, give everybody a chance to chime in. Um, I've tried to unmute almost all the lines except the ones that are marked rogue lines. So um, if you have any questions uh, for anybody here, in particular uh, Justin Stottlemyre of Shutterfly, please uh, chime in, questions, comments, insights, uh, please share. John, you had a question, did you? Well, my question really was around uh, uh, trend, processor trends, so, so uh, increases in co compute capacity versus storage requirements, and when you, when you sort of, and, and access density, and when you sort of stack those up, and you look at the increased compute requirements of this type, type of approach, are you comfortable that, we are, that, the, that, the, tr that the processor trend will stay ahead of the requirements? Uh, 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 absolutely, um, and, and I suspect that, that there will be specific uh, ASICs or whatever it is uh, to to actually uh, help achieve these sort of um, uh, capabilities. Um, Justin, you're, you're actually doing some work in this area, aren't you? Um, a little bit. Actually, one of the things that I've actually, uh, what we're doing, I've got a couple of different components that I've looked at doing. Um, as well as I'm looking at using from some bit for bit compression style stuff, and I was looking at doing some custom style ASICs for uh, some of that workload. But it actually ends up that you know between the amount of CPU and FPU you require to do uh, any of this erasure coding component, I'm actually running out of network bandwidth before I run out of CPU in most okay. cases. So it ends up that even today's CPUs are very powerful. Um, now I am doing a separate. Uh, I'm basically split, splitting out my erasure coding tier from my storage tier, right? So effectively, I'm doing a two-layer architecture where they're both horizontally separately scalable. So my uh, erasure coding tier is actually, you know, just stacks of Intel boxes effectively that, uh, you know, if I start to run out of CPU, I just plop another one in the mix. And, you know, I'm only running on, uh, I think, dual quad cores right now, and so there's a lot of headroom left. A lot of headroom to, mm -hmm. to be able to go on that. You know, I'm running on uh, basically highly cost performance models where if you really wanted to crank it up, you could go with the latest and greatest from Intel. I'm just kind of uh, stuck waiting for the prices to drop to keep things com as commoditized as possible. I'm trying to remain on the, uh, on the safe side of that cost performance curve. 
N minus one uh, technology, I presume. Uh, kind of N plus M again there, actually, but yeah, effectively. So, um, um, how about how about? Can I ask uh, what the relative cost to disk ratio is? You know, the control is a disk ratio. Is mm -hmm. that is that uh, in line with the raise or, or a bit no, higher? Even, or? No, it's much much lower. I'm not even close to this mm -hmm. cost. I'm actually I've actually got that cost included in my entire 33 percent target. Right. So, David, what's a what's a? It's, it's much much lower. David, what's a what's a normal ratio? Is it? One to one? Uh, a normal ratio is about 10 to one. 10 to one, you're saying disk to controller? No. Yeah, uh, the, 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 okay. the, the raw cost of the disk to the cost of the array. Um, so uh, you, know, you can buy a Fry's disk, <laughs> the, the Fry's disk ah, model. OK, OK. So you're saying the, the, uh, the premium, you're saying, uh, is 10 to one. The premium that you, you pay uh, um, is 10 to one. If, uh, from, from, the, from buying your disk at Fry's to, uh, to getting your so you're paying you're paying you're paying uh, array vendors 10x what you would uh, raw storage. You're saying normally yes. uh, and in enterprise that's storage. Thing. I mean, it's just what it costs. I'm just I'm, I'm just trying to get the numbers out. And, and Justin, you're saying your ratio is sub substantially lower, a little bit lower. Substantially, but I won't say exactly what it is today. <laughs> For a public company, I can't give away too much data as uh, could affect. Uh, you know, there's there's numbers on the street that get targeted. Okay, great. Um, how about uh, disaster recovery? Uh, what, can you talk about your business continuity strategy? So, um, I don't know. I think that's something that they're looking to fund a little bit more. I've got a lot of ideas around how I would do something like that, as well as potentially doing erasure coding in multiple locations amongst multiple locations if I can support the latency quite effectively uh, with the clever safe model. I could put, um, you know, half a copy of it, well, effectively 2.2 .2 copies of the data. I could put 1.1 copies in one location, 1.1 copy in another location, and have much greater reliability than even three or four copies of the data, potentially. Hmm. And so that'd be one potential model. Uh, today, we're actually effectively in one site with uh, off-site tape. OK, interesting. So you've got basically. Now, uh, effectively, I mean, pr the part of the problem was that you know when you got 20 petabytes of traditional storage archive, um, when somebody goes to the board to say, to say you know, how am I going to build this? OK, you've got to build this again. Here's what it costs to buy another 20 petabytes of storage. Right. Who are you going to sell that to? <laughs> so that's a really tough sell. Today, you know, with greater reduced storage costs, probably something we'll be able to tackle. OK. Sure. So today you've got a single location, which helps with performance, and you go into tape. So if you had to recover from tape, you know, it'd take a while, but you could do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. I, I have a, a sick feeling in my stomach that when, when I try to unmute all these lines, I actually muted them. I, it happens a lot sometimes when I play the mute buttons. People call me up and I say, I was trying to ask a question, because we have a lot of people online. And um, if, if you can't get a question in, if you want to tweet me at, at dvellante, I'd be happy to to ask it or if anybody else whose line is not muted um, cares to chime in, now's the time. We've just got a couple minutes left. I, I, I'm interested in your RAIN approach. Um, if, if, what, what types of uh, hardware are you using there and you know, what, what uh, you obviously got your stack of uh, erasure processing in the front end. Um, how are you how are you arranging things inside that array architecture? So, uh, the hardware is actually a custom hardware platform that um, we will probably announce as an interesting little tech tidbit at some point, but we haven't done so yet. Uh, so we're running completely custom hardware on the back side. So I've been a product and project manager for uh, bending my own metal and getting all that sort of work done. And um, so. Uh, Done a lot. We've done a lot of testing around performance and availability and reliability, trying to keep uh, overhead costs roughly the same as traditional rates. So, uh, you know, with a you know with a 20 to 25 percent usable or burn model uh, for RAID data, I'm actually running uh, like 16 plus six in my RAID array right now, in some cases, and I have some that'll be as high as 20 plus six. So that's. Wow, yes. So that you can get a huge amount of availability from uh, 22, uh, 16, 22, yeah. Exactly. 
And again, I said like uh, the next set I'm looking to roll out will actually be uh, 20 plus six. So that'll be um, uh, basically the six or the six parity bits will have to be more than enough to cover um, actually even a lot more data than I'm looking to throw at it. But I want to remain on the safe side. And why does the network have become the bottleneck? And what, what do you think the solutions are there? Do you have to go to InfiniBand or something like that for something local? Um, I actually think some of it has to do with just interrupts on the on the bus potentially. Um, uh, I'm I'm so I'm not entirely network bound there. Um, some of it, you know, but I can hit 70, 80 percent utilization on the network port with a single CPU right now, which obviously, you know, theoretically you can get to 100 yeah. percent. Theoretically you can get to 100 percent, but. So right now I'm probably actually at a decent model for CPU to network. I'm pretty close to kind of peaking both out around the same time. Um, I think as, not necessarily InfiniBand, but basically as 10 gig copper becomes um, more ubiquitous through the data center, which I'd imagine almost anyone doing Greenfield is today. Uh, in addition, there's companies like Zigo that do, a, you know, if you're going Greenfield, they can give you massive boosts in performance and cost for relatively low you know, compared to doing a traditional top of network style design, they can drop your costs phenomenally and give you, you know, 40 gigabit throughput on a single box. And so I think that, you know, some of the new technologies like Zico, which is now probably going to be acquired by someone, I'd imagine, um, or uh, just a copper 10 gig in the data center, which is, you know, a fraction of the available, you know, a fraction of the problems of fiber 10 gig. Or the call and a fraction of the cost, and as you know, production ramps up for those, and they become the ubiquitous model in the data center. I'd imagine that that'll really be uh, where the network starts to really take off and allow for more bandwidth back and forth. You know, latency won't change much, but you'll have a lot more pipes. And then um, at the same time, right, we'll be seeing increases in CPU over time, and those will come down on the price performance curve. So hopefully, they'll kind of coincide, or for me at least, around the same time. What does this mean for the, uh, this is rocket science, what, um, the, um, that's a compliment. What does this mean for the enterprise? Is that a reasonable question to ask? I mean, they have watched out with technology here in the right. I think it's absolutely a, a reasonable question to ask, and I think that um, the short answer is that the enterprise has mostly nothing to worry about. You know, I've, we are, um, we're helping to set a trend here, I think, but it's, and it's the beginning of a change, but um, you know, people have been declaring uh, the death of all sorts of technologies for a very long time, and uh, it's proven to be very adaptable and very much an evolving market, and I'm pretty sure that they'll continue to do so, right? Brocade has purchased other, uh, other companies and technologies to further themselves. So Hitachi have done the same. EMC have done multiple, right? They effectively have Isilon now, which is basically erasure coding. Um, and so all of these traditional companies are going to continue to evolve and change. Uh, but as always, they're also usually, you know, they're not startups. They're not going to have uh, first first initiator. They're not going to be taking those first steps. They're going to be playing catch up like they usually are uh, and then trying to bring their economy to scale into it. But that's not going to be so easy with commodity style platforms. So I think like, uh, you know, you'll see Dell, you'll see IBM, you'll see these guys that already have a foothold in the commodity market really be able to take a lot more advantage of this. Was that was that Tim who asked that question? It was indeed. Hi, Tim. How you doing? Thanks for coming on. Okay, we've got uh, just about a minute left if anybody has one last question. Um, if not, we're going to wrap. This, this is Alex Williams of Silicon Angle. I, I was just curious about the practical integration requirements that, 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 that this involves. Uh, thinking from the perspective, again, of like the enterprise customer who's seen this the scaling of you know storage requirements that they have. So it can be difficult, but I don't think it's uh, nearly as impossible as people tend to think of it. Um, maybe I'm just an eternal optimist, but you know, being a storage guy, I sort of doubt it. <laughs> um, you know, like I said before, that you know, when you're dealing with metadata and changing metadata mechanisms, you know, effectively, your data, whoever your application developer is, was already working with the database and maintaining metadata in state in some way, shape, or form. So, you know, in most cases, you're trying to add an additional copy of this metadata in a new form with potentially a lookup table on Oracle database. 
um, as well as potentially a new uh, mechanism by which you push data in or out, right? You may have been using a completely traditional file system before uh, and just doing block-based workloads where with some of, uh, you know, as you scale up larger and larger, that's probably not a very uh, good solution at absolutely massive scale. You want something that's much more distributed than having single I.O. going through a single system at any given time. You want to be able to, you know, effectively use the model I'm using or an EC3 model where you can distribute it. And yes, you'll see slightly increased latency, but, you know, you're going to have to give up something somewhere for uh, massive scalability in your archive. Okay, guys, we have to wrap. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, so, uh, great session. Uh, I want to thank Justin Stalemeyer, who's the Director of Storage Architecture at Sh Shutterfly, and also uh, the, the SNEA colleagues, Sebastian Zingaro and Chad Thibodeau. Thank you very much for coming on. Sebastian, I'm sorry that we had some trouble with the line. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, David Floyer, uh, Tim Stammers, and Alex Williams for your questions and your participation today. And my colleague and partner, John MacArthur, and uh, Jeff Kelly, who's manning the cameras and the TriCaster, thank you very much. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, right after this meeting, we go into the after call and we develop uh, themes for six research notes that we'll have posted within 24 hours on the Wikibon site. We'll be consolidating those into a newsletter, so look for those. Feel free to hit the edit key and uh, improve the pieces or write your own or write a wiki tip. Uh, we appreciate the contributions from our community and we thank you very much for listening today. So uh, look for that information. Uh, thanks for coming on and um, we'll see you next time. Bye for now.